All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to be discussing how UCSF Health hires and retains nurses in the third year of the pandemic. Uh, and just as a reminder to everyone, this, set, this webinar will be recorded. You will have access to it afterwards. Um, and please, throughout the, throughout the course of the webinar, please feel free to uh, send your questions in the chat. And we'll, we, there will be time at the end for Q&A too. All right, my name is Imana Bouzaid. Uh, I'm an MD by background, and, and I've been in technology for many years of my career. I'm the CEO and co-founder and uh, co-founder of Incredible Health, which is the fastest growing career marketplace for healthcare workers and for nurses in particular in the US today. Uh, Incredible Health is the only platform that allows hospitals and health systems to hire nurses in permanent roles in 20 days or less. We flip the script um, and where hospitals and health systems apply to nurses instead of waiting for nurses to apply to them. Joining us today is Dr. Pat Patton. He is the System Chief Nursing Chief Nurse Executive and VP for Patient Care Services at UCSF, UCSF Health. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with UCSF Health, but I'll just share a few accolades anyway. UCSF Health consistently ranks among uh, one of the top 10 US top 10 hospitals in the US uh, by the US News and World Report. It's also a two-time magnet designated uh, hospital as well. Pat, of course, is a nurse by background, and, uh, and most recently, he was the chief nursing officer at the, at the University of California in Irvine, uh, where he led the organization to their fourth magnet designation, and he's also been named top 50 CNOs to know in the United States. Pat, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Aman. Happy to be here. All right. So today, we'll be, um, we will be dis having an interactive discussion. Uh, please, everyone who's on the call, feel free to submit your questions in the chat as, as, we, as we go through the agenda here and as we go through these topics. Um, we're going to be covering the nurse labor market today. Uh, we're going to be hearing Pat's strategies for driving nurse retention, uh, including the training of nurses for excellence. Uh, we'll be talking about hiring, especially during the pandemic, uh, how Incredible Health supports UCSF and other teams as well. And then there will be plenty of time for Q&A. All right, so let's just start with a quick market overview. So we're all, you know, just um, set, setting the setting the picture now. So uh, you know, I, we know that there are HR, nursing, and operations executives on the call, um, and many other leaders on the call who are facing some of these challenges that I'm about to talk about. So healthcare is the biggest labor sector in the country by number of workers, but there's an enormous and increasing demand on our healthcare system. Uh, initially, you know, uh, one in eight Americans today works in healthcare, and and since 2018, it has actually been the number one employment sector. Now, the problem we are we are all facing is that the supply of workers of healthcare workers has not kept up with the demand on the healthcare system, and that's a challenge that we we're all facing together. Uh, the problem is is getting worse. We uh, we are on track to be short 1.1 million nurses by the end of this year. Uh, the annual uh, acute care nurse turnover nationally is 18.7%, and that has increased since the pandemic started by about 2%. Uh, labor as a percentage of revenue also uh, continues to increase because of labor costs is going up. We have wage inflation throughout the country, um, not just from travel nurses, but also from our per uh, permanent nurses as well. Um, and that as, you know, especially as the labor pool tightens. And then the average time to hire a nurse is at 82 days. This is for a permanent uh, specialized acute care nurse. On average right now, it's 82 days, which is, which is you know, that's a national average. So, you know, one, wanted to share some of the studies that we've done recently at Incredible Health. So this is a study that was uh, with 400,000 nurses who are in our proprietary database. We always ask nurses when they sign up at, uh, for Incredible Health, what are the reasons for why they're changing jobs? And these are the reasons uh, listed in order. Uh, of, of frequency selected by the nurse, nurses. So by far the number one reason why nurses are changing jobs or leaving health systems is because they wanna advance their career. They're trying to grow their skills. Uh, they are trying to um, move up in leadership uh, or they're trying to cross train. Uh, so something to do with advancing their careers is, is, which they can't get at their current employer and that's what they're seeking in their new employer. The second most common reason is they're looking for a more flexible schedule. Um, or greater balance in their, in their, in their work life. Um, flexible scheduling, including 
uh, flexibility around which shifts they can choose uh, around weekend options um, has, is increasingly more and more popular. Uh, float pools and internal travel uh, pools are also increasingly popular because nurses are looking for more flexibility in their schedules. The third most common reason is something to do with their location, right? They're trying to reduce their commute time or they're trying to re relocate. And then um, the last is, is they're looking for increased compensation. I did want to just really call this out because many executives do concentrate a lot on the compensation piece and the competition around the salaries and so on. But just keep, please keep in mind that there are uh, three other more, even more common reasons why nurses leave health systems um, that are listed here. All right, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment while we do a quick Q&A with, with, with Pat so he can share some of his insights. So um, Pat, we'd love, to share, we'd love it if you can share um, you know, UCSF's overall nurse retention strategy. There's a, a lot of leaders here who, who are trying to tackle that problem of, of turnover and, and driving retention. And would love to hear your thoughts, strategy, tactics on how to do that. Great, um, sure, uh, Iman. Happy to share and, and appreciate you asking. You know, one of the things that we've looked at um, here at UCSF Health, and knowing that again, the buzzwords that come around today is that we're getting ready to go into the great retirement, um, and it's already started. We actually have seen more nurses retire here at UCSF Health this year than we have in previous years, and. In looking at what the, the pandemic has done to us over the last two and a half years, we're not surprised. Um, but the question is now, how can we retain more of those nurses going forward in that space? And so we're taking a multi-pronged approach here at UCSF Health to look at things um, hopefully in a different way. Hopefully um, some of the strategies are tried and true that many of the nurse and HR leaders here today have known what is happening. Others were trying to be a little bit more innovative. Um, so we're looking at, you know, uh, really our new grad program. I'll talk about that a little bit later and um, how um, our education department has really developed a strong new grad program to bring people in and then to keep them once they're here as new grads. Um, looking at how um, you, you talked about nurses wanting to advance their careers. So one of the things that we're um, looking at doing is how do we make sure that we give nurses time off to go back to school um, in order to advance their careers, but then keep them in our system. So retain them once they do have that advanced degree. Um, one of the unique strategies, and, and most people wouldn't think that this maybe would be part of a retention strategy, but to really look at strengthening our exit interview process. So we need to really find out why nurses are leaving in order to retain them, right? To develop the strategies about why they're leaving. So the top five reasons you shared earlier, are those true to UCSF Health? And if they are, what are we doing to retain them? Another innovative approach we're looking at is, how are we looking at reducing the EHR burden for our nurses? We know our nurses had talked about they're spending way too much time in the electronic health record and spending too much time charting. So how do we do that? And we're partnering with a, um, a large um, study organization in the United States to, to do just that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, again, uh, some of my nurse colleagues on the line will attest to that we have to be out there rounding. Um, nurse execs, nurse leaders, nursing directors have to be out there constantly rounding to talk to our nurses and not to talk with them, but to listen to them and listen to what they're saying. Because if we don't know what's going on at the front line, we can't help to fix it. And then we can't help to retain the, our nurses. So listening to them is key. We've also developed um, a chief nurse executive open office hours. So me and my three chief nursing officers are on the phone every two weeks to open up the lines to anybody who wants to come and talk to us so we can hear. And we have solved problem after problem after problem. And it's just unique, some of the things that come up that are irritants to the nurses, but we don't know because we weren't listening before, but now we're listening to help them to, um, to stay there. We do nursing town halls every other month to, to really broadcast it. One of our nurses has said, you know, Pat, we'd like to know what our other nurses are across the system. So we highlight two nurses every time in the town halls to really then highlight what they're doing across the system in that space. We have a solid clinical nurse ladder to really retain our nurses to help them advance, not only if they're not advancing their degrees, but advancing in their current status of what they're doing. And then I think last but not least is, you know, nurses want to work in a place that is properly staffed, right? They want to staff and have proper staffing on their units. So we make sure that we have different strategies to make sure they're staffed for every shift. So those are a few of the things that we're doing, Iman, to 
yep. really help retain our nurses. Got it. Yeah, I think you're the the point you made earlier around just making sure you're addressing the top reasons why nurses are leaving is probably, is probably definitely one way to formulate a strategy. And it sounds like you're, you know, tackling each of those. I um, want to go into a little bit more detail. So uh, first, are you, would you be open to sharing uh, what UCSF health nurse retention or, or turnover numbers are? Yeah, so um, currently our turnover uh, rates right now are at 9.2%. Um, and although we're happy that we're lower than the national and the state average, um, we're still not going to rest on those laurels because it was just 7% two years ago. So, yeah. how, you know, we know it's going up and we, we need to retain our nurses. Got it. Okay. So you also made the point around, um, you know, nurses having a seat at the table, uh, especially when you and you and your leadership team are making strategic decisions. Can you just walk us through how that, that looks like at UCSF? Absolutely. One of the things that um, we have recently done is really looked at our strategic plan in the nursing division on how we can look at it differently. So um, uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I brought 152 nurses together to really look at that strategic plan. And I made sure that at least half of those um, uh, nurses at the table were staff nurses and not just nurse leaders, because um, sometimes it's easier to get nurse leaders at the table versus staff nurses, but you have to engage your staff nurses for them to have a seat at the table and really to help direct our um, strategic plan was key to us um, in looking at that. And then in, in, a, in amidst that, then we have to have a strong shared governance platform so that our nurses' voices are heard at the unit level so that it bubbles up then to the hospital level, to the system level, so that we're hearing their voices and making changes that are pertinent to them and not necessarily pertinent to leadership. Now, we know we have to lead in different ways because we can see the bigger picture, but we also have to hear what's happening at the unit level. Yep. Got it. And, then, and so how are you driving... Um engagement with, you know, the, the UCSF staff nurse, like the app, you know, I don't want to say use the word average, but you know what I mean, that the, the staff nurse. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, I talked about earlier was our, um, you know, uh, CNE open office hours and town halls yep. and, and what that has um, done for us is that it's open and engaged and allowed our staff nurses to feel comfortable to reach out to um, uh, the, the CNOs to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now, we, we, we always ask them, you know, have you talked to your manager? Have you talked to your director? But when they need to have a discussion with us, we're open to have those discussions with them. And, and they feel like that their voices are heard, right? We're engaging them in a different way by having that one-on-one -on -one dialogue with them so that we can listen to what they need, listen to what they say. Sometimes they wanna just share their frustrations, but other times they wanna share the successes that they're doing. Yeah. So engaging them in both successes and frustrations, I think is key to that. Would you be open to giving us like a couple of examples of the frustrations or successes that are being shared in these open office hours or in um, town halls? Absolutely. So um, uh, I, I'm sure many of the people on the webinar today have heard of the Redonda Vought case. And so one of the things that we did was we had a CNO open a CNE open office hour discussion about just that, right? Mm -hmm. what, what did they feel? How were they feeling? What were they doing in their spaces to do that? And we, we knew that our rates for our um, uh, barcode med administration were at 97%. So we felt strong that people were actually scanning the meds. But there was one area in our organization that brought up to say, Pat, we are not doing that because we don't have the tools and equipment to do that in our space. And we think that we've been forgotten. Can you help that? Help us. Mm -hmm. And so we immediately went there, put a team, our chief nursing informatics officer, our um, pharmacy leaders, our nursing leaders, all um, then descended upon that unit, helped them. And it wasn't a nursing um, unit, but it was one of our ancillary departments, but they were able to help them and fix it. And our nurses then felt much better and felt much safer because that they were not now forgotten, but they had the tools that they needed to do that. And it really helped them engage because those two staff nurses spoke up at a CNE open office hours that allowed us to engage them in a different way. Yeah, those are great examples. So look, we have a, a lot of nursing leaders on the call. And what would you say, what was, what's your top or number one piece of advice for them? You know, I, I'd say, listen, right? Um, uh, I will cancel a meeting that I have that, that I have to sit there and listen to in order to meet with a nurse. Right. So if a nurse reaches out to me and they want to talk to me, I will cancel another meeting or reschedule another meeting in order to talk with them because they are my most important people that I need to listen to every day. Mm -hmm. So we have to engage with them uh, on a personal level. 
And I, I think the second thing is to really look at and, and, and foster the positive communications, right? We have to foster what's going well. As I said earlier, a lot of times we'll hear frustrations and nurses will tell you everything that's going wrong or how staffing is not up to par or how we need more nurses or I don't have the equipment to do my job. Yep. But we also need to hear what they're doing right. Are we celebrating? We just had um, a thousand days of PLABC free um, on our pediatric unit. And so my pediatric CNO and I went there and we celebrated them on day shift and night shift to celebrate their success in what they're doing. And we have to do that more and more and more. And again, take an appreciative inquiry approach to look at how are we doing things right? And then how do we continue what we're doing right to make things even more right in the future? So we have to do those different types of things um, to do that. And as I said earlier, looking at staffing ongoing, listening to the nurses, listening to innovative staffing approaches so that we can look at things. That's in our current strategic plan is how are we going to look at a different staffing model so we can make sure we're staffed for the future so that if our nurses are leaving more, what are we going to do that in the future? Got it. So there's a few questions that came through in the chat related to, related to this topic of, you know, of listening, uh, listening to the staff nurses. So one very specific question is um, from Lisa Campbell is, um, how much engagement do you get with the open office hours and how long do they last? Yep. I, you know, it's it's funny uh, you ask that because it's it's always crickets for the first five or 10 minutes. People <laughs> are too shy to speak up. But then once the questions start, we get engagement for the rest of the time. And it's usually anywhere between 30 minutes and a, to an hour, depending. It, it's scheduled for 30 minutes, but if people want to continue to talk, we then talk for the full hour um, to do that. So it's 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 short, sweet, to the point but it opens up the dialogue, number one, and then they always reach out then afterwards to follow up. So it's it's really successful in how we engage frontline nurses as well as nursing leaders, right? Um, yep. um, in order for, to hear them as well. And is that is that every week, every month? Every uh, every two weeks we have every CNE weeks. open office hours. Got it. And then another, another tactical question, do you do it uh, on Zoom or do you do it um, remotely or in person? Yep, remotely so that we can get people wherever they're at. And so if they're at home and they just got off a night shift and they want to join on their drive home or if they just want to join from home and they're off that day, we do it Zoom so we can get more attendance. Great. Okay, so let's dive into the topic of training nurses. You know, that that uh, career advancement is one of the top things that nurses are looking for. Uh, Incredible Health, we recently published another study recently just focus on uh, new, new nurse graduates, particularly that Gen Z gener generation. And uh, we, we found that uh, the top, like by far the number one thing that nurses are looking for, including those that are coming out of school um, during their job search is how good is the job training at, at this employer. Um, and so we know that UCSF has honestly pretty consistently been a leader in nurse training, um, just given your you know, academic center uh, roots. Can you just share a little bit more about uh, the nurse training and career development and what that looks like at UCSF? Absolutely. Um, so I have, um, I oversee the Center for Nursing Excellence and Innovation. And in there um, is our uh, nursing education department. And I have an incredible um, nursing education leader, um, uh, Dr. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Mike, uh, Dr. Michael Francis. And He's incredible and has really set up a strong um, nursing professional development department with his nursing department, nursing professional development generalists and specialists in that area. He's also helped develop a, um, a strong new grad nursing program that is now accredited by ANCC um, as a PTAP program to really bring people in and to give them a structured process over six months um, in order to train them. Um, and amidst that, um, in this past year, we have acquired a space down um, in San Francisco on the Embarcadero. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Embarcadero at San Francisco, it's right on the wharf. So we're right across the, the street from Pier 39. And in that space, he has an incredible space where he can do different modes of education for not only new grads, but all of our nurses to do that. So whether it's CPR or ACLS or annual competencies or different education for new glucometers, whatever it is, he's taken that space and he's transformed it and he's continuing to transform it really into the education center for the future. So we'll be creating 10 sim labs down there. We'll have a full oper OR suite. We'll have um, an ambulatory office. We'll have five uh, patient care rooms that will simulate a nursing unit of one patient care assignment for a med-surg unit. 
um, to do those things. He's got a lot going on that we'll be doing in order to train our nurses for the future. And not only nurses, but we're planning to make it a true interdisciplinary training center and an innovation center so that we can innovate and our nurses and physicians can help innovate for the future to make sure that we're staying ahead of the game and not behind the game. Got it. And then as you're looking to the future, like how, how, how are you thinking about evolving nurse training at UCSF? Absolutely. So we um, are putting together an onboarding task force because we hear strongly from our nurses and nurse leaders that their onboarding process maybe wasn't as ideal as they thought it could be, right? Um, and I know that many of us struggle uh, throughout the country with that process. So we're putting that together to make sure that we have a solid process, number one. Number two, we need to understand what are the learning tactics of today, right? So the learning tactics today may be different from yesterday. So how are we looking at things differently? Um, are we using virtual reality? Are you we using augmented reality in order for us to look at things differently and to train um, our um, uh, caregivers for the future in a different way that helps them look at things um, all the all the time? Um, and that, that those are a few things that we're doing just to make sure that, like I said, we're staying ahead of the game. Okay. And then um, speaking, of, uh, as far as the new graduates goes specifically, what is, can you just, just describe UCSF's uh, new graduate program and sort of the philosophy around that? Absolutely. So we have um, two uh, new grad cohorts that we do per year um, that we start one in April and one in October. When we open up um, those positions, we have over 700 applicants that apply for about 70 to 80 slots that we have. They're open for new grads each year. So once we have that cohort solidified, we bring them in and we do an opening day to make sure that they feel comfortable with the organization, they get comfortable with who we are, what we're doing. Um, myself and my adult and pediatric CNO show up to make sure that they can see their nursing leaders from the very beginning, number one introduce ourselves, but also make sure that they feel welcome to UCSF Health. Mm -hmm. um, in, in doing that, we make sure that they have strong preceptors that they're scheduled with. Um, they have didactic learning once a month that they're um, spending time um, with Dr. Francis and his team at the Embarcadero. Um, they do skill validations and we continue to hear over and over and over again um, how strong that program is and how um, they, they feel really strong um, coming to that program. Um, and then I meet with them once a month. So I come to their meetings once a month and talk to them just about a different topic. And one of the great things that, that I heard the last time is they said, Pat, when I come to UCSF, I feel safe. I feel safe to practice here. And for a chief nurse, that is so strong and it just makes my heart warm because when a new grad feels safe to practice, I know we are doing something right. And I know our team across the organization is doing something right. Got it, okay. And then do, uh, your team uh, supports cross-training as well. Can you, can you describe that a little bit more too? Absolutely. So we have two different things that we do for cross-training. One is our career development training program, which we call CDTP. And any nurse in our organization who wants to change positions and go to a different area of practice can do so during that cohort. Um, right now, um, our job descriptions are they, uh, you have to meet certain requirements to get into that department. Well, if you don't have those requirements, you can't transfer during the year. But during this one time during a year, you can transfer. So let's say I want to be a med, I'm a med surge nurse today and I want to be an emergency department nurse or I'm a critical care nurse and I want to go to the ambulatory infusion center. During that time, you can transfer, and we do the same thing that we do during our new grad program in that we make sure that they have the training, the support, the precepting in order then to transition into that different space of career development for them. It helps them really feel supported, number one, but also number two, it gives our nurses who may have been in med-surg for 10, 12, 15 years and now wants to try something new so that they're supported to transition. The second part of that is then we have an external experience training program, meaning that the same thing, if I'm in an outside facility, I want to come into UCSF, but I'm a med surge nurse and I want to transfer into something, I'm a critical care nurse, want to transfer into something different, they can do that and we support them in the exact same way through that program and our training program here at UCSF Health. Got it. And then, uh, you know, there's on, on the incredible health uh, marketplace and platform, uh, many of the nurses want 
in the th within the theme of career advancement are looking for roles that offer cross training. So how do you support this for nurses that don't necessarily work at UCSF yet? Yes, so those um, either they can come in through the new grad program or they can come in through that external experience program um, through applying from the outside to the inside. And, and we designate those specifically so people know that they can transfer into UCSF um, if they don't have experience in that area. Okay, and then how, you know, there, there's already been several questions that have come through the chat about uh, nurse managers. Um, curious, how, how, do you turn, how do you train your nurse leaders and think about their development? Absolutely. So um, we have realized that, you know, in my opinion, the nurse manager role is probably the hardest role in the hospital. They have so many tasks to do. We constantly ask them to do one thing more. There's constantly something coming down from the regulatory department that, that, that asks us to do one more audit or one more tracer in order for them to stay compliant with on their units in that space. Then they have to retain their nurses. Then they have to hire their nurses. So it's a very hard position to do. So we realized that we needed to do something for them and to make sure we supported them 150%. Similar to CNE open office hours, we have um, a, a unit director, assistant unit director meeting. We also have a, um, a coordinating council program um, that we come and we come and listen to them. They all attend those meetings and we listen to them about what can we do for them? Where can we go? So when we listen to them, they said, Pat, we just need some formal leadership development training. We need, we need more tools in our toolbox in order for us to then lead um, our units in a better way. So we said, absolutely. So I um, partnered with the Dean of the School of Nursing and our Associate Dean for the School of Nursing, and we developed what we call the Leadership Institute at UCSF Health. And that Leadership Institute has then now really been robustly built into looking at how we're developing nurses and nursing leaders for the future um, in that space. What, I mean, what would you recommend for nursing leaders that you know, don't necessarily have their own School of Nursing <laughs> locally or? Yeah. yeah. So I so I recommend that they find um, some type of, of leadership program or programming yeah. that they can put into place. And everyone has an HR department, so everybody can work with their um, organizational development section of their HR department to really look at how do we build that out together, right? And there are many resources across the country that can help them do that or their HR department can do that. One thing we said is HR um, uh, um, usually has many offerings around just different courses and classes, but can you put that in a concise format so that as a nursing leader, I can say all of my nursing leaders need A, B, and C, and I want them to go in that order so that we're all talking the same leadership language at the same time, so that when I come on and I talk about X, crucial conversations or conflict yep. management, everybody knows what I'm talking about because we've all been through that same course together. Got it, okay. So there's there's uh, leaders uh, who are de developing similar programs. Can you just share a little bit more about like the levels of support that you have in this in what you described as a leadership institute? Absolutely. So um, uh, Justin Pohl, who is our director and Dr. KT Waxman, who's our co-director of that program have really developed four levels of that leadership institute that we're looking at. So level one is our nursing um, uh, nurses at the front line who um, haven't really gotten into management yet. Maybe they're charge nurses. Maybe they just started as an assistant unit director. Maybe they're staff nurse wanting to be a charge nurse or leader. And so we've developed a program to really help them introduce to what leadership really is. What does a leader do every day? What does a nurse manager or nursing director do every day? Um, so help help them do that, plus then give them some skills, some basic leadership skills on how to be a, a formal leader. Then we go to level two. So level two are nursing leaders who've come into the organization who have then been a leader for maybe one to three years. Um, they've really gotten into their role. They've kind of figured it out, but now they need more tools in their toolkit to do that. So we do that, we develop them, we give them a coach, we help them um, go through some other leadership principles on how to become stronger leaders in their current area. Um, and they come out of that with a, a deeper appreciation um, of leadership, number one. But number two, we stick them with not only a, a, an external coach, but we give them a mentor within the organization that is outside their area of practice so that they can really then bounce things off of each other and understand each other throughout the organization and have found that to be very successful. 
As you move into level three, those are nursing leaders that have been usually leaders for greater than five years. And um, uh, they're, they're going through and they're like, you know what, I need some more education. I need to really understand leadership in a different way. And so we've taken that then to the next level. And how do we train them in a different way to help them give them more, um, again, tools for their toolkit, but also then help them think of leadership in a different way. Get them more to the strategic approach. Have them think more strategically instead of thinking, you know, in the weeds all the time to do that. And then finally, we have the health executive leadership program um, that we do for either executives, new executives into our organization. Um, and that's from all throughout, not, not even in nursing, but throughout um, all the areas of the organization or people who want to be executives. So our senior directors who are now looking to get into a VP role um, to put in that program. We're, we're in the midst of that program. We're actually taking them to Washington DC in a couple of weeks um, to really help them introduce to not only, again, leadership, but then what does it mean to be part of legislation, right? What does it mean to talk to your legislator? Because those things we don't do enough of um, in healthcare to be engaged from a hospital or a healthcare level, we need to do more of that. So engaging those leaders in a different way. So we've really developed a multi-pronged approach to help our leaders grow. Okay, got it. Um, that's fantastic, Pat. Thank you. So in, in the next topic we wanted to transition to is the topic of hiring. But honestly, it's not really a different topic, right? Because hiring and retention are, you know, two sides of the same coin. A lot of the tactics you described, you know, in the last 30 minutes, you know, are, are similar tactics that are used to attract nurses to UCSF Health as well and to, and to keep them there. So I would love to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, ab about how UCSF positions itself as a nurse employer of choice, because we know, you know, hiring for your system is, is critical. Absolutely. You know, um, we just did a deep dive into looking at statistics and how we can remain that, you know, top employer of choice to do that. So um, we know that we pay um, top wage in the Bay Area um, because we have to, right? It is so hard to live in the Bay Area because of the expenses here. So that's number one. Number two, you mentioned at the beginning um, of this webinar that, you know, we are a top 10 hospital in the United States and we plan to remain there because of the things that we do, um, the care that we provide. You know, um, not, our physicians not only do um, great care and take care of great care of our patients, um, but nurses do too, right? And a lot of times nurses are not touted for the care that they provide, but it's nurses who are at the bedside 24-7 in and, and, and looking at that um, and how we do it. When we looked at our data uh, around that, you know, we found that we actually get 28 applicants for every position that's open. Now, that doesn't mean that all those 28 applicants are, are, are you know, competent or they, you know, meet the requirements for that position, but we do get a lot of um, applicants for each of those positions. Um, and, and people want to come to us because, you know, they trust us, number one. They want to be part of our organization, number two. Um, they trust our leadership because we know we have great leaders here at UCSF. And they want to um, come to a place where they feel like they belong. They want to feel like they belong to an organization that really has their backs and listens to them. Um, and they always say want to, to be a part of an organization that has a vision for the future and where we want to go um, in that space. Um, our, vi our vision here at UCSF Health is to be the number one nursing division in the world not in the United States, but in the world and then where we're going and how we're doing that. And we have a variety of ways in order to get there and we're excited about the future. Got it. Okay. One of the, um, no, that's, that's great, by the way. I love, I love the ambition of being the number one nursing program in the world. Um, the, the, one of the topics uh, we want to mention as far as hiring goes is flexible scheduling. Um, it is one of the top requests from nurses who are already uh, inside the health system. And it's also one of the top requests for those that are uh, looking to join an organization too. So how, how do you think about the whole topic of, of scheduling and, and enabling flexible scheduling for nurses? Yeah, absolutely. You're exactly right. Um, you know, uh, there's two, there are things, two things that they always um, say as a nursing leader, you have to attest to. You don't mess with the nurse's schedule and you don't mess with their pay, right? And so as long as those twos are, two are done and then you're golden, um, uh, not golden, but you know, those are the things that are the basics, right? So we're looking at how do we provide scheduling in a different way? How can we do, um, you know, uh, staff, uh, self scheduling so that our nurses can really help self schedule themselves into the the days that they want, um, the hours that they want. Uh, we've re recently moved to um, permanent shifts. We used to have variable shifts here at UCSF, 
um, where you maybe worked one or two schedules on days and one or two schedules on nights um, to do that. Um, it was a, uh, a um, process that worked in the past. Um, and we heard from our nurses that they wanted more permanent um, shifts in their scheduling. So we did that. And so we moved people and they had, again, according to seniority, had the right to either have full-time day shift or full-time night shift. And then it wasn't going to change for the future. When people look at self-scheduling, they know that they may want to schedule themselves, you know, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then have four days off in a row. Or if they're working the Saturday, Sunday, they may work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then have four days off in a row um, to do that. And when nurses do self-scheduling, they can really then work on not only their scheduling, but then work on their vacation so that they don't have to use a lot of their PTO time up in order for them to then um, work and go forward in the future. So it's a great way to help um, increase nurse satisfaction and nurse retention as we talked about earlier. Got it. One of the, uh, the, the nursing leaders we, we work with uh, extensively throughout, throughout the country, you know, are dealing with a, a pretty challenging topic as it relates to scheduling in that you know, what you said earlier around this, the seniority or the preference for, um, for the nurses that are already there. And that makes it a little, that makes hiring a little tricky because it means like, you know, a lot of night shift, a lot of night shift options are open and they're, those are tougher to hire for. Sort of how do you think about the balance of the you know, nurses that are coming into UCSF versus those that are already there uh, when it comes to the topic of, of scheduling and, and self-scheduling? Yeah, so it, you know, it's a great question. We have to we have to look at where our where our nurses are in their continuum, right? To do that, um, and, and we honor seniority, right? Nurses who have given their lives and their careers to UCSF, we make sure that they rise to the top, right? So when yeah. they're self scheduling to do that, in order to retain them, and as nurses come in from the outside, most nurses know that a lot of times they have to start um, on night shift, right, in order then to get somewhere. But, but people find out quickly that if I get in and I can get in the door, right, um, on night shift and, and do my time on night shift, I can then progress in our organization in different ways. Um, and if they want to stay on night shift, great. We love to keep them on night shift. And I have several nurses who've told me, Pat, I don't ever want to move to days. Days is too chaotic. I would love to stay on night. So you have those people who love to do that, right, um, in that space. But there are also people who know that they can then transition today's quickly once they get into the system. Got it. Okay. And then uh, look, the pandemic has impacted nurse hiring um, all over the country. Uh, how, how has it impacted uh, UCSF's nurse hiring specifically? Yeah. So um, uh, it was uh, tough at the beginning, right? At the beginning, we didn't know what we didn't know, right? Um, and so many patients were getting sick. There were many precautions put in place. And so we did a great job of taking care of our patients um, as the pandemic went. The, the issue now is that we have nurses because all of our um, restrictions have been, not all, but the 90% of them have been lifted. So now our nurses are getting sick, right? And so now we're having staffing challenges because our staff, not only nurses, but physicians and lab, radiology are getting sick. And so staffing to get people in the door um, to do that. One of the things we had to quickly figure out is what were we going to do going forward to hire more nurses in the system, knowing that we were going to have those nurses out. Um, one strategy that um, we developed, which was successful for us, um, is that we reached out to our retired nurses and we said, um, how would you like to come back? And they said, absolutely. We were able to get nine retired nurses to come back into um, uh, the health system in order for them to, to continue to work to do that. And they wanted to serve during the pandemic, which was just really um, exciting to hear. The second strategy we did was we reached out to um, our nurses who had been out of their nursing profession for over a year. So they had gone off and they had to have child and take it, taking care of their child for two or three years until um, they had gotten old enough to say go to preschool or they just had gotten out because of career choices or whatever reason they got out of nursing they did, but now wanted to come back. Um, we posted um, uh, 20 positions and we had 15 nurses actually apply and get accepted into those positions and come back. We did a new uh, a nurse re-entry um, program for them to come back in and found it highly successful. Now, we did find that we did have to extend their orientation time just a little bit to get them back up to speed, but they have been absolutely excellent nurses um, for us. Um, coming back into the profession because we gave them a chance to come back in and gave them the support to come back in to be where that they're at. Got it. Uh, you shared earlier that the that the turnover at, at the nursing turnover at UCSF is a nine point two percent, which is 
you know, congrats on that, by the way. Like it's still dramatically better than the national average of 18%. Um, but it has gone up, right? It's gone up two percentage points in the last couple of years. Do you attribute all of that to the pandemic? Or what, what do you think are, is the cause, for UCSF specifically, what's the cause of that increase in turnover that's happened in the last couple of years? Well, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's a few things for us here in the Bay Area. I would say, yes, I think the pandemic rises to the top. Of, of that turnover. I think number two for us um, in the Bay Area is that people have found out that their spouses can now work remotely so they can move anywhere in the country to live that is much cheaper than living in the Bay Area. So they will go there and our nurses are going and finding positions in areas of the country that where it's a lot cheaper to live um, uh, in the Bay Area uh, to do that. And then I think three, that nurses um, are, are really wanting to advance their careers. Like you said at the beginning, it's a top reason that they're leaving. And so um, we have an excellent school of nursing. They're getting their nurse practitioner, whether it's a pediatric nurse practitioner, psych nurse practitioner, adult nurse practitioner, um, or CNS or CRNA, and they're leaving then to go someplace else um, to work um, and, and advance their career uh, because of that. Got it. Okay. Um, so what we'll do next is just do a quick overview of what, what Incredible Health is and how we, how we work with UCSF and, and many other teams. And then there's going to be plenty of time um, at the end for, for, for q and I know that a lot of questions have been submitted in the chat. So yeah, please feel free to continue to share, share your questions in the chat and we'll try to address as, as many of them if, as we can um, towards the end here. So Incredible Health is a software platform. Uh, we are a marketplace technology. And hospitals and health systems use our custom matching technology to hire high quality permanent nurses in less than 20 days. We already work with over 500 hospitals and health systems across the country. We're alive in 25 states. Um, we work with academic medical centers like UCSF and Stanford and Cedar sinai and others. We work with many uh, large health systems like HCA Healthcare and Tenet and Baylor Scott and White and lots of community hospitals as well. Um, UCSF was actually one of our early adopters. You know, our company did start in San Francisco in the Bay Area before expanding across 25 states in the last few years. And um, the UCSF health team, both, you know, their, their talent acquisition team uses our platform to hire permanent nurses. And we're, you know, for UCSF in particular, we're not really used for new graduate nurses. Like I'm sure, you, Pat, you don't have any, any trouble filling your, some of your, your, your new grad cohorts where the challenge is, is the experienced nurses and those that are more sp specialized as well. So on average, um, the nurses that, have, that the UCSF team has that's hired from the Incredible Health platform have an average of 16 years of experience. You know, our platform ranges any, everywhere from, you know, one year to 30 years. And then 80% of the uh, nurses that, they, that this team has hired from our platform are in hard to fill areas. Um, like the ER, the OR, the cath lab, these tend to be the areas that are the toughest to hire for. You know, Pat shared earlier 28 applicants per role. Uh, these are the roles that have the fewest number of qualified applicants that we uh, support them with. And so uh, we, there's a few things that are unique about Incredible Health that make the platform work. Number one, the employers apply to the talent instead of the other way around. As you can imagine, the nurses absolutely love that, right? Because they create a profile on the Incredible Health platform, say they are looking for a job in the Bay Area, and they sit back and relax, and they get interview requests from UCSF and Stanford and Kaiser and, um, and so on, right? And they, and HCA and others, and they're able to choose which interviews to accept and which ones to decline. Um, in addition to that, we have proprietary screening. So all the talent is pre-vetted and pre-screened by um, Incredible Health's um, data algorithms and team before they are put in front of UCSF's you know, talent acquisition team. And then we also have built custom matching algorithms for every single employer that we work with. So the UCSF team has pretty unique needs, you know, and um, we have to have matching that matches that. You know, so it's important that when uh, the UCSF recruiters are using our platform and they log in, like they don't want to see 276 nurses. They want to see, you know, the 15 or 16 nurses that are the right fit for UCSF, uh, UCSF roles at that time. And then we also provide a robust set of data analytics uh, because we are working with so many health systems at this point. Uh, the UCSF team is able to compare uh, their performance with their competitors anonymously, of course how nurses are converting from one step to the next. They can also see the speed of, you know, how many days nurses are spending in each step of their process compared to their competitors. And then because we are working with so many hospitals and health systems, we're able to share the top tactics for what, a, for what nursing and HR teams are doing to accelerate hiring and enhance their hiring internally. 
Um, in addition, we also offer a whole range of free nurse uh, of tools, free services and tools to nurses that are available in our iOS apps or Android apps. Uh, everything at Incredible Health is free, 100% free for nurses. We offer free continuing education for every single nurse in the country. Um, they use it to renew, you know, complete their continuing education and then subsequently renew and activate their licenses. We have salary estimators that are free um, that they, where they can filter by specialty as well and by location. We have free career coaching for every single nurse in the country. Um, we have an exclusive social network that's for nurses. Um, it, it's really used as an advice platform where nurses can ask highly specific questions and we are automatically pinging nurses like them. So for example, let's say you're an ER nurse and you're asking a very specific question about, about the ER or about expanding your skills in the ER, we are automatically pinging the ER nurses in our database who go in and answer with a pretty high quality answer. Um, and then we have free mental health tools and lots of content and articles on our blog available for nurses um, as a, you know, a career resource center. I uh, wanted to just share a few more statistics uh, with, with everybody on the call. First is that 68% um, of nurses on our platform and just you know, even outside of Incredible Health accept the very first offer they receive. So speed is one of the most um, biggest competitive advantages uh, a, an employer can, can drive in their hiring processes. We find that speed is even more important in some ways than brand, than compensation, um, uh, than some of these other factors. I mean, all the factors matter, but if, if, if a health system is acing their speed and have really streamlined internal hiring operations, they tend to be able to hire more than, um, than the competitors in their area that are uh, hiring slower. Um, we also know that 61% of nurses are accepting the very first offer they receive, even if the second or third offer has higher compensation. Uh, so nurses really are looking for that strong candidate experience. Um, they are usually already working while they are looking for a job. And so don't have much time for, um, uh, it, not, not, they don't have much time for slow hiring processes or bottlenecks uh, in the hiring process. Uh, this is just a quick case study. This happens to be a team in the LA area. And so these are different steps in the hiring process. Uh, with incredible health, they're able to hire in 19 days. So from the time, uh, the time to source is really cut down. Um, and then with more conventional hiring, it's taking 66 days. And these are the sort of metrics that we want to drive, that we drive for many of the health systems that we work with. Uh, that helps the nursing leaders like Pat and others really offset their travel nursing costs, offset their overtime costs, and better staff their units, which also improves retention. Uh, we have a 15% higher nurse retention rate uh, of all the nurses hired on our platform, higher than the baseline that the health system has. The reason for that is because the nurses were able to consider multiple opportunities before explicitly choosing UCSF Health. So this, was a very, this, is, this enables a very well thought out and thorough job search process for the nurse, as opposed to taking you know, the first thing they can get. And it's the matching algorithms and screening algorithms that really enable that um, as well. This is um, how we work with, uh, with teams. This is a true partnership and it is a new model in talent acquisition. So I have here the, the eight steps of the hiring process. Everybody roughly has the same steps all the way from sourcing the talent to getting offers accepted. And so Incredible Health is really doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the first four steps. So sourcing, pre-screening, confirming the nurse is actively looking and getting that first phone screen scheduled. And then at that point, the UCSF talent acquisition team is taking them through the rest of the process. You know, they're completing their phone screens, getting hiring manager interviews completed, getting offers out and getting them accepted. Uh, and so this is a true, uh, true partnership. It's a collaboration. It takes both parties to make this work. And it is a newer model in talent acquisition because what, what the, what the um, talent acquisition teams are really doing is that they are offloading some of these earlier, more administrative tasks uh, to free up recruiter time to spend with candidates and to spend with hiring managers. Um, and so we talk a lot about nurses, you know, uh, operating at the top of their skill set or top of their license, but even nurse recruiters need to operate at the, at the, stop, at the top of their skill set as well. And the top of their skill set is building relationships with candidates and hiring managers. It's not necessarily these administrative tasks like sourcing. Um, so I will pause there. My team will be sending uh, in the chat, you know, how to get in touch with us as well as how to book a demo um, as we go through the Q&A. And then also just um, we'll, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can in our last 10 minutes here. Uh, but if there are any additional questions, uh, please feel free to send them uh, to questions at incrediblehealth.com and either the Incredible Health, Health team and or Pat will be able to answer them for you as well. All right, so let's go through some of these questions that have come through. Um, 
So uh, one question did come through, Pat, for you around ratios and maintaining ratios in, 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 in your staffing. How do you think about that topic? And um, we know that, you know, California has mandates around, around staffing ratios, but how do you, how do you pull it off? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, um, you know, uh, we as nursing leaders know that we have to have forward thinking um, strategies to do that. So at the beginning of the um, pandemic, we knew that we were going to have nursing challenges. We knew we had to be at ratios. Um, we knew that we are a union shop and we knew we were going to be held accountable. So we, yeah. we did purposefully look ahead of that. And we reached out and hired 150 travelers to come in to really staff it. Now, 150 may sound like a lot to some hospitals, but we're a six hospital system, right? We have three adult hospitals, two children's hospitals, and a psychiatric hospital. So 150 nurses is not a lot, but we took I took 150 nurses and I actually put them in the float pool and allowed the float pool to manage them so that wherever the need was and wherever the shortage was that they could then distribute them appropriately in order to meet our needs, both adults, peds, um, and psychiatric nurses. And it, it has worked throughout the, the pandemic. But, you know, um, Iman, that's one question I think about every 12 hours to look at staffing and where we're at to what we're doing and to make sure we check in to make sure we're safe and keeping our nurses safe. So um, it, it's, it's a top of mind all the time. Got it. Okay. And then another question that came through um, for you, Pat, as well is how do you, what does your, what does your care model look like? And do you have team nursing? It's, a, it's, it's another great question. We do not have team nursing um, as of right now. Um, in two of our areas, we have primary nursing where I don't have any nursing assistance, but we reduce the ratios so the nurses um, are doing all the care for their patients um, in the primary nursing. Um, but majority is the traditional nursing, nursing assistant, um, where the nurses have a set of patients and the, the nursing assistants have their sets of patients um, to do that. And again, it's part of our strategic plan to think differently for new care models for the future because we know we have to be different. We can't, we can't be stuck in the same care model um, plan for now um, going forward. Got it. Uh, there, another question came through around your onboarding process. I know I, there's a lot, lot of leaders on the call here who are looking to upgrade your, their onboarding process for nursing. And you mentioned that as, as you know, you have plans in the works for that as well. Would you be able to just share a few more details? So, you know, it's one of those things that we have, we know that once they come in the door that we've got to, we've got to have a strong process and we are not as strong as we would like to be right now, but coming in, make sure that they have badge access from day one, make sure that they have access to Epic day one, right, in order to do that, making sure that they have um, their list of competencies on day one to do that. Um, again, our education department has done an amazing job at reducing our RN orientation to one day. So we have one day of RN orientation. They have one day of hospital orientation, one day of RN orientation, so that we can get them back on the floors as quickly as possible, and then place them with a preceptor who is strong and really has really taken a preceptor class to know how to precept effectively um, to do that, and then take them through their competency so they feel, again, safe to practice on their floor. Um, question that came in for, for me, uh, is when do you, do you uh, when are you expanding your services to New York and specifically home care? And then similar question, when are you expanding to, um, EMS or pre-hospitals? So, uh, we, we are live in, in the New York area, um, and throughout the Northeast. We primarily focus right now on acute care hospitals and health systems, um, and can support them in their inpatient and outpatient settings with the nurses that they need. We do not, um, and we don't do, uh, we don't work with home health organizations yet, and we don't work with EMS yet. And so that's coming in the future. Right now, we're very focused on our geographic expansion at Incredible Health and focus on RNs and NPs in inpatient and outpatient settings. Now, if the health system has a home health program as well, we support that, but we, we are not supporting yet home, standalone home health organizations. Um, Another question for you, Pat. Uh, this is what she's going to do popcorn style. Lots of, lots of different topics. Um, would you, do you use e-learning as part of your leadership program, leadership training program? Um, I, I, we do. Um, a part of it is e-learning, but the most of it is in person um, because we feel like in person is really the way to go to make sure that they have 
um, a deeper learning. There, there are many programs out there that are total e-learning for leadership development, but we really feel strongly that um, in-person is much better. Got it. Okay. Um, do you have a nurse manager peer group as part of that learning for leadership program? Yes. So the, um, that's one of the things that we really found. We, we weren't sure where, how that was going to go as we developed the Leadership Institute. And this nurse peer group, which everyone who comes into that leadership development, no matter what step they're in, they get a peer to mentor them for the six months or four months, depending on the course they're taking that they're in. So they get somebody that they get to talk to, and then they, that mentor gets to develop. Do they want to talk to them once a week, every two weeks, every month um, to do that? But we, they, that is one of the strongest comments we have done. We've seen in our evaluations that they so appreciate that nursing peer um, interaction um, even more than their coach because they can talk to them in a different way. And they understand UCSF so that they can really um, add to um, either the dialogue that's going on, help um, understand their frustration and develop solutions together, or help celebrate successes across the system. Okay. And then um, there's a question that came in about sick callouts. Uh, just curious, do you know how many sick callouts you typically get in one day across your six hospitals? And, and more importantly, how do you handle sick callouts? Yeah, I, I again, I see that data every actually every 12 hours. And um, so I get it for adults and peds and in psychiatry and the perioperative space to do that. You know, our average call outs, it all depends. Um, uh, during the pandemic, we were getting 28 to 30 call outs um, across the six hospitals. Um, recently has gotten gotten up to 50, 60, 70 call outs. Um, across the system. And so they are so challenging to deal with. When you get up to 60 or 70, it's it's so difficult. So you're pulling break nurses. You're looking at how you look at different ways to, to staff. Um, we try at all possible not to close any beds because we don't have any beds to close. We are constantly backed up in the ER and the PACU um, to do that. So it is really just moving the dominoes around just to continue to maintain ratios, but continue to maintain safe, safe staffing. And again, our flow pool um, has really helped us tremendously, as well as um, our traveling agency that we have um, brought in to help us. Got it. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is, uh, I'm guessing this question came from a nursing leader. Can you share uh, more information about how you're approaching the goal of reducing time in the electronic health record? Absolutely. So we've, um, again, um, uh, developed a relationship with a research organization that is helping us do that. We sent out a questionnaire to all of our nurses, respiratory therapists, PCAs, um, physicians to say, how is it you're charting? What are your frustrations? Where are you at? Now we have that data back and we're looking at it and prioritizing that data and really saying, what is the most frustrating? And then what are the quick wins? What can we do something about quickly? And then what are other long-term strategies we need to develop with the rest of the frustrations so that we can um, uh, deal with that effectively? And again, we're, we're lucky to have Epic as an electronic health record because they have what they call a, a nursing um, assessment tool, um, efficiency assessment tool, it's called NEAT, um, that really helps you determine where are they spending the majority of their time in the record? You know, do you have nurses who spend more time than others in the record? How do you do that? So you can not only do it on an individual basis, but you can do it on a unit in a system basis on reducing time in the EMR. So we're coming up with multiple strategies to figure that out together. Okay, great. As a reminder to everyone, this uh, session was recorded or is being recorded, and we will be sending, sending it out to all everyone who attended the webinar. Uh, and it will be available on our website, incrediblehealth.com as well. Um, our team also shared links in the chat. Um, they can share it again right now about um, if you want to sign up and, and find out more about Incredible, Incredible Health or if you want to talk to anyone on the team. Uh, we are, you can um, find us at incrediblehealth.com. Uh, and then, Pat, just to end here, you've got some great accolades uh, in, the, in the chat <laughs> uh, of many attendees thanking you for the event today. Thanks, you know, um, Teresa Nardantonia saying, thank you, Pat, for sharing these great strategies and your support for nursing. Uh, Denise Brace Thomas saying, thank you for a great presentation. And um, just, yeah, great topic. Thank you. Great job, Pat. <laughs> um, and a, yeah, very, yeah, very lot, lots of strong comments about your, uh, your details around the shared governance structure and giving nurses a voice in your town halls. So thank you so much, Pat, for sharing your, 
your expertise and your leadership and your tactics and your strategies uh, with everybody on the call. Um, and just really appreciate your time. Well, thanks so much, Iman. And we so appreciate working with Incredible Health here at UCSF Health to make sure we bring um, our nurses in the door who want to be here at UCSF Health. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day, everyone. All right. See you, Pat. Bye.